Sheila Kohatkar, author of Black Edge, who is Stephen Cohen? Stephen Cohen was and continues to be a legendary figure in the financial world. He built up an enormous personal fortune almost entirely on the basis of his incredible skill for trading. So he he had a really strong instinct for the stock market. He would sit down behind his screens and just sort of look at the way stocks were trading every day and was believed to have this very intuitive, incredible sense of how to sort of ride the waves in the market and make money. And he has this very compelling, almost rags to riches story. He grew up very middle class in Great Neck, Long Island, which was an affluent town. His family had, um, relatively speaking, less money than a lot of others around him. So I think from an early age, you know, he felt a sort of hunger to become rich. You know, he's, he was very good at playing poker. He started playing poker in high school. He went to Wharton, famous business school, and then he launched his hedge fund, SAC Capital, in 1992 and very quickly built up a multi-billion dollar fortune and he has the lifestyle to match. Um, a 36,000 square foot mansion in Greenwich, Connecticut, helicopter rides, $100 million works of art, uh, his own ice rink and Zamboni. So he became an object of extreme envy on Wall Street very quickly. S-A-C capital, does it stand for the obvious? Yes, his initials. Stephen A. Cohen. He, he, he embodied the firm in every way. Late in your book, <clears throat> There's a moment where you come in contact with him, and he, you say in your book that he wouldn't talk to you for this book. Tell us about that moment. Well, I had spent several years reporting this book, and um, I went about doing that the way any investigative reporter does. You know, I, start, I had a lot of court documents, I did a lot of interviews with people, and I had tried multiple times to, you know, convince him to sit with me. And of course, I would have loved to talk with him. And by the time the story reached its conclusion and the moment you refer to in the book, he had largely won the legal case. And I thought, you know, he may have a compelling reason to actually talk now. He kind of, he beat the system, you know, he's, he's trying to remake his reputation. So I heard he was going to be attending a, a very um, sort of rarefied special art auction at Christie's Auction House in Manhattan. And, you know, I had met with Steve Cohen's staff and his people several times, I'd written him letters. But, you know, and they'd always said, oh, maybe he'll meet with you, but they never really said no. So I went there and I just sort of ambushed him. <laughs> you know, I, um, I knew he was going to come. He was selling a painting that night. And I stood in the door and I saw him come in. And it was, it was the first time I actually really spoken to him directly. And it was, you know, it was a powerful moment for me because I felt like I knew him so well at this point. I'd spoken to dozens of people who'd worked with him, his family members. And... Um, you know, we had a brief exchange and he basically, as soon as he figured out who I was, he, he sort of said, oh, I, you know, I don't think I can really talk to you. And he sort of ran away and um, he looked very relaxed. He arrived just before the auction was set to begin, which I thought was just interesting because he's so important in the art world. He's literally one of the biggest and most important modern art collectors in the world. Uh, he knew that Christie's would never start without him. I mean, he was a VIP in that world. So... Um, you know, and I sort of said to him, you know, what are you doing tonight? Are you buying or selling? And I, I knew it had been reported he was selling a painting uh, out of his collection. And he said, oh, no, I'm selling, I'm selling. And then he went into the auction, and just a few minutes later, he paid, I think it was $140 million for a Giacometti sculpture. Let me stop you. Let's look at a little piece of video that shows people what he paid, 140, I think you say 141 million. Yep. Let's just watch this. How could that be worth $141 million? <laughs> Well, it is worth whatever someone is willing to pay for it. That's how the market works. And um, it is interesting because he, I think Cohen uh, is reported to have purchased at least two of those sculptures for $140 million range. He'd bought one prior to this one. That was Pointing Man. I think he'd bought, um, he purchased another one called Chariot as well. Uh, I think part of the reason the prices have become so elevated for these particular works of art is because this very, very small group of hedge fund billionaires in particular have become competitive about art collecting. And, um, you know, I think it happened to a lot of them that they, they achieved a lot of financial success fairly early and they sort of realized that they were still not seen as these sort of sophisticated, cultured people. They were just thought of as Wall Street guys. 
and many of them became interested in the art world. You know, it was a way to just enter this whole other universe of sort of high culture, and you would have your photo appear in the society pages, you could get your name onto a wall in a museum. So many of uh, Cohen's contemporaries became really interested in art, and they, they end up in this sort of arms race, bidding up certain artists into these stratospheric prices, and there is, you know, a lot of people believe there's a big bubble in the art market. How much is he worth today? Uh, I believe it's at least ten billion dollars. Uh, he, um, you know, by the time all of this legal drama ended, he was forced to sort of shut down his hedge fund, SAC Capital, but he was still allowed to manage his own money through his private family office. So he's he's got a pool of his own money. It's upwards of ten billion dollars, and he still trades it every day in the market. So his lifestyle is largely unchanged from what it was before. How many people, when he had SAC Capital? <clears throat> went to prison or were, were they were convicted or they pled and are going to be sentenced? How many around him? Well, uh, at least eight were either convicted or pled guilty. However, uh, the two, you know, and these were either former or current SEC employees. A handful of others were connected to insider trading more indirectly. However, the two kind of central characters at the heart of the story, they're, they're very central characters in my book, are these two former portfolio managers for Cohen's uh, fund. Um, Matthew Martoma is one of them, and Michael Steinberg is the other one. And Martoma is currently serving a fairly lengthy prison sentence, although his case is on appeal. And Mr. Steinberg was convicted, but then his conviction was later overturned after an appeals court made a ruling that made it much harder to convict someone for insider trading. And uh, he is now doing other things with his life. Has Stephen Cohen ever been convicted of anything or charged with anything? No, absolutely not. Well, uh, I should clarify, the SEC did charge him with failing to supervise his employees. That uh, was sort of the final thing that happened, but it was a fairly light charge that was settled uh, for a financial penalty and some modifications to his business. But he was never charged with any crime himself. And um, there was sort of a dramatic moment in the story, which I recount in the book, where you know the government, the Department of Justice, FBI, and the SEC lawyers had spent years trying to build up a case against Cohen. And they had been, you know, trying to flip people and get cooperators who could lead them inside SAC. They had wiretaps on people. They had been uh, tracking him for years. And finally, in 2013, there's sort of this dramatic moment where they have to decide, okay, what are we going to do? And the in entire world was watching. This was a very high-profile case. There was tremendous news media coverage. The financial industry was sort of riveted, wanted to know whether this huge star of their world was possibly going to go to jail. And um, I describe this scene in the book where Mr. Cohen's lawyers came in to meet with the prosecutors and make a presentation and try to persuade them not to charge their client. And this is something that apparently happens, you know, many defendants are given the opportunity to come in and sort of present their defense. So a handful of Steve Cohen's very high-priced defense lawyers came in there and there were around 17 government attorneys present. These were SEC lawyers, uh, criminal prosecutors, FBI agents, all these people who'd been involved in different aspects of the case. And Mr. Cohen's lawyers, um, they made a four-hour presentation. They gave out these binders to everyone in the room, and they basically made the argument that, um, you know, there was this very critical email that people were wondering whether Cohen had read it and it contained what they believed was inside information. And his lawyers essentially said, you have no proof he read the email. You have no witness to put on the stand. He knew the government was very nervous about losing a big case. So they really targeted that weakness. And they said, you have no one to put on the stand and say they saw him do it or they talked about it with him. Um, you know, there's no evidence he read this email. Even if he did read the email, it might not be illegal. And they just sort of hammered that point home over and over again. And the government attorneys left that meeting and they still felt fairly sure of what they felt, which was like, oh, it really looked pretty bad. It looked like Cohen might be guilty of something. However, they had to go and have a really hard conversation about the evidence they had and what they could do with it. And they ended up deciding that they did not have 
enough evidence to bring to a jury and be sure that they could win. So they ended up indicting Cohen's company instead of Cohen himself. And that company paid how much? In total, to the uh, government. in total, one point eight billion dollars. That was uh, so one chunk of that was an SEC fine, and one point two billion, approximately, was sort of a criminal settlement. Once in a while, I see that you were an, uh, a traitor. Where, where did that all start? <clears throat> and we need to define things like what is insider trading. Sure. So I, one of the reasons I became interested in this story and it really connected with me is because I started my career uh, working at two very small hedge funds. Uh, I was actually an analyst, which is a little different from a trader. So the analyst is, the, is sort of the egghead who does the research. Traders are the ones who sit there and decide when to buy or sell. And uh, you know, often people making decisions about trades will talk to the analysts and they'll say, well, is this a good company? Should we put our money in this company? Or should we be selling this? You know, what's happening? What's going to happen in the future? Uh, what are the product orders like? And um, you know, my job was to try and analyze our investments and then help guide uh, the portfolio manager in making these decisions. And then a trader would execute them. So um, you know, it's important to understand this word edge uh, to kind of understand the concept of inside information. So inside Steve Cohen's former hedge fund, SAC, there was a portfolio manager who had this system for rating information and he tried to teach it to the young guys working for him uh, so that they could stay out of trouble because there's a constant concern that you're going to end up with some information that you shouldn't have. And um, you know, hedge funds are very driven by information. The better the information is that you have, the, the more likely you are to make money. If you have bad information, you're going to lose money. So everybody's out there in the market every day trying to get the best sharpest, most useful information. Let me ask you first about, uh, again <clears throat> about a hedge fund. Can I invest in a hedge fund? It, that depends on uh, what your investable assets are, meaning... But let's say it's yeah. small. <clears throat> so in general, hedge funds are intended to cater to wealthy investors who can afford, in theory, to lose the money they put in. What's the difference between buying a stock from uh, a company or through a broker and investing in a hedge fund? Well, so hedge funds were conceived as this boutique kind of rarefied product that were catering that was catering towards wealthy investors. And the idea was that a hedge fund was going to take a lot more risk in the market, potentially, than a regular mutual fund, for example, where, you know, at Fidelity or State Street. So, um, you know, regulators looked at this and they said, well, you know, if you're going to be taking all this risk, if you're going to be borrowing money and trading it, or if you're going to be shorting stocks, which is uh, basically betting that a stock will go down rather than up, and it's a very risky activity, uh, not everyone does it. The SEC kind of said you can only do that if you're only taking money from people who could afford to lose the money. We don't want you taking money from middle class, you know, dentists or teachers or whoever who will be devastated if they lose this money. Well, this was a little Why trade. is the government telling, you know, protecting me? Well, you, that's the purpose of securities regulators, is to make sure the market is fair and transparent and that people aren't getting fleeced by these fancy hedge fund guys. How many hedge funds are there? Thousands. Thousands. Do they all make money? Uh, I would I would uh, argue that probably most of them do not make money, but a handful of them make a tremendous amount of money, and they have made the founders of the hedge funds extremely wealthy. And um, partly this is because they charge very hefty fees, much higher fees than you would pay to Vanguard or you know any of your mutual fund companies. I mean, they charge typically two to three percent of the assets that they're managing. So, in other words, if I gave them a million dollars, they would take two percent off the top, just to kind of cover their overhead. Then, at the end of the year, they figure out what profit they made. Let's say they make a hundred percent profit. In other words, their whole hedge fund starts out being worth. 10 billion at the end of the year it's worth 20 billion. So they're going to take that look at that profit that 100% profit and depending on the fund they're going to take 20% sometimes even 50% of that profit and keep it for themselves and that is known as an incentive fee. That is supposed to be motivation for the hedge fund manager to not do anything really foolish and to to work really hard to make money for How much did Mr. Cohen take from that? He 
he had some of the highest fees in the business, 50%. And I will say that even with those high fees, uh, his returns were spectacular. He, uh, especially during his earlier period, he um, was often returning 30, 40, 70%. Uh, and investors were fighting to get into his fund all the time because he was just churning out profits. And when did you work in, the, in a hedge fund? Uh, I was working in a hedge fund from around, let me think here, 98 to 2002. And so, how big was it? How big was the office? Tiny. And I will say right what, now, this five, day, six, yeah, hundred? oh yeah, less, fewer than ten employees, both of them. And um, this is how this is how Steve Cohen's hedge fund started, and this is how the whole hedge fund industry began um, during that period. I mean, a lot of hedge funds started by just one or two people who just did not want to go work at Goldman Sachs. They didn't want they didn't want to have to deal with the big corporate culture there. They didn't want to wear suits. You know, they were smart. They just want to make money. They were scrappy and ambitious. So a lot of these hedge funds were little shops opened up by two or three people. And often, um, you know, especially, you know, if the, the people were doing well, they would grow very quickly. And, um, you well, know, you... Let's say, for instance, um, you're at this small hedge fund and I have a lot of money and I call you up and who do I talk to when I call up? Well, it depends. If you're a small, uh, I'm small. I'm a, a brand new me. small hedge fund, you might call up and speak to the, the fund manager. If you're a slick, sophisticated, multi-billion dollar hedge fund, you will talk to a, a, a department uh, that is there to cater to investors. Well, it, let's it, say I call the hedge fund and say, I'd like yeah. to invest. Do I just write you a check? Uh, it's a little more complicated than that. You have to kind of prove that you have enough net worth to qualify to be an investor. It's also possible that the particular hedge fund, if it's a very hot in-demand hedge fund, might not just take money from anybody. I mean, this this often happens with the really hot, uh, high-performing ones. They can kind of pick which investors they want. And um, well, what kind of people work in a hedge fund office? What kind of people? Uh, do you mean like the staff positions? Yeah, or just in other words, we walk in there, what, where do these folks come from? Well. Male, female? Uh, minorities in the business? Sure. I mean, I, I will say that hedge funds became very quickly one of the most uh, if effective and efficient vehicles to kind of become extremely wealthy. They became known as places to go if you wanted to get really, really rich. And you could make more money at a hedge fund than you could even at a big bank like a Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan. So eventually, over time, uh, hedge funds started attracting the best students out of Ivy League colleges, math uh, graduates from MIT, uh, young, ambitious, hungry kids with PhDs in science and computer programming, often these people are flocking to hedge funds. Where did, where did you come from to, to a hedge fund? Well, I came from a very different background. I what, came, what is it? Uh, Where'd you grow up? Toronto. Parents were from? My father's from India. My mother's from the Midwest. Is that the Kohatkar name, Indian? Yes, that is a South Asian name. One of the things that's interesting that we have in your book is there are a lot of uh, Indian Americans that are you're writing about. Did that it's cross true. your mind as you're writing about? I mean, it was obvious. It was remarkable. I mean, there are a lot of South Asians sort of in all corners, and in, in the government side and the hedge fund world, and. Um, I, I would occasionally ask people why that, if anyone thought about that, and you know, the one explanation I got was that uh, many of these sort of insider trading rings that the government was pursuing are uh, spring up out of personal relationships and personal networks, and often um, people end up involved in that kind of behavior with their friends and their the people they went to college with. So you would end up with these circles of people where yes, you'd have certain groups overrepresented and. It was interesting to me. You went to school where? Uh, I graduated from NYU. New York University. In what? I have a degree in film. In film? Yeah. Yeah. And what Very did you random. do after you worked for the hedge funds? Well, I spent about five years working for these two hedge funds. Um, it wasn't at all what I intended to do, as you can discern from the fact that I have a film degree. And I kind of fell into it by accident. And um, the whole time I was there, it was sort of, I mean, I, I learned a tremendous amount and I actually loved that, but I felt a bit like an anthropologist in this world that was really foreign to me. And every year I would kind of say to myself, okay, 
you know, I'm, I'm going to do this for one more year and then I'm going to get out and I'm going to go become a writer or a journalist or I'm going to do something else. And then every year I would get a bonus and I would think, oh, well, you know, maybe I should stay a little longer. And, um, you know, I think that's what I think that's what draws a lot of people into that world. The um, the money draws people in. Did so. you make a lot of money when you were there? Not relative to what a lot of money would be now, but for me at the time, it was a lot. And your job now is what? I'm a staff writer at The New Yorker. This is a very <clears throat> detailed book about a lot of names and all we're not going to be able to get into, but I want to jump right into something. This is from 2011. Uh, thanks to PBS Frontline, you were on this program, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, I think it ran in 2014, and it's available on the website if people want to watch it. It's an hour. But here's Stephen calling in a deposition, which I want you to explain. What did you see there? Where is that from? Uh, that deposition was a, uh, it was a video of a deposition he gave in a case that was um, really a, a private commercial litigation um, involving a company called Fairfax, which is a Canadian insurance company that had accused a bunch of hedge funds of manipulating its stock. Did you watch all of that deposition? I've watched some of it. I am not certain if I've watched all of it. Um, it's available on the PBS Frontline website, by the way, if people want to watch it. Yes, yeah, no, it, it's interesting. It's interesting. I remember when, I remember when those um, were leaked. It was quite dramatic. Can, we're going to jump around. But people that want to know more, it's in the book. They can read it. But I want to go to 2008, Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Sid Gilman. Oh, yes. Set it up, please. Who is Dr. Sid Gilman? Well, Dr. Gilman was a very accomplished um, Alzheimer's researcher. He University had, of Michigan. At the University of Michigan. He, um, he was head of the medical department there. He, um, you know, he authored medical papers. He mentored students. He helped with drug trials. He was a lion of the scientific community, very highly regarded. Uh, he was in his 70s, I think, at the time many of the events in the book took place. And, um, you know, at one point, one of Steve Cohen's portfolio managers, Matthew Martoma, uh, you know, decided um, that he wanted to research a drug trial. He wanted to invest in the development of this drug. There were two drug companies creating, um, trying to invent a, you know, come up with a cure for Alzheimer's. Elon and Wyeth. Wyeth yes. And those have both been purchased since then. Yes, I don't remember exactly what's happened to them, but yes, they both had, I think they've both been taken over. Pfizer took over Wyeth, and yeah. I, I, I can't remember the name of the company that took over the other one. But, so, so we're, in, we're in Chicago. So developing a drug is extremely expensive, and going through the FDA drug approval process is expensive. So often companies will team up to do this, and that's what these two did. Now, Matthew Martoma, when he arrived at Steve Cohen's fund, uh, he was very ambitious. He wanted to make a lot of money. He was looking for a winning trading idea, and he was an expert in technology stocks and biotechnology stocks and drug companies. So he, he had been tracking the uh, development of this Alzheimer's drug, and there was tremendous commercial potential for this Alzheimer's drug. Basically, for any company that found a cure for Alzheimer's, there were billions of dollars to be made. This is a disease with no cure, and it's devastating to millions of people. So Martoma started looking around for people who could help him learn more about this drug trial. And um, he ended up becoming connected to Dr. Gilman. And over a number of months, cultivated a relationship with Dr. Gilman uh, that culminated in him getting uh, allegedly inside information from Dr. Gilman about this drug trial. And there's a very dramatic moment that I recount in the book where Dr. Gilman appears at a medical conference in uh, Chicago. I think it's in July of 2008. And it's this big unveiling of the final trial results of this Alzheimer's drug trial. And this auditorium at a hotel in downtown Chicago is packed, and there are scientific researchers there, there are university presidents there, there are drug company representatives there, and there are a lot of traders and analysts from Wall Street, because all of Wall Street has been sort of gambling one way or another on the outcome of this drug trial. So Dr. Gilman stands up there and sort of clears his throat, and he announces uh, the drug trial results, and he shows this whole PowerPoint. 
And he was trying to be optimistic because I think he was so hopeful and wanted so badly for these this drug to work. But ultimately, the people in the audience understood that the trial had shown that the drug was not working. It was not. It was not. Uh, you know, it was not. It was not becoming more effective if you took a higher dose. You know, there are all sorts of problems with it. So immediately, everyone on Wall Street starts trying to sell, 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 sell. These sort of code red alerts go out. Everyone's dumping their shares. Well, it turned out Martoma uh, allegedly had gotten this information the week before, and SAC Capital had already sold off its whole position and, in fact, shorted the two stocks. And um, you know, it really illustrated the difference there. I mean, all of these people who did not have the benefit of that information earlier ended up losing money because the stocks plunged. Did you ever interview Dr. Gilman? No. Did you ever interview Matt Martoma? No, uh, I did. And what's his real name? Matthew Martoma. Uh, Ajay Matthew Mariam Dami Thomas, I believe was his given name, and he did change his name at one point. Why? You would have to ask him. But he's a story in himself. He is quite a character. Um, Where is he right now? He is in prison in Florida, and his case is on appeal. Is he from India originally? Uh, his family is. He's of Indian descent. There was a time when this man um, fainted. Yes. In your story. There are several fainting men in my book. Yeah, I, I, I mean, just dropped. Well, yeah, well, um, the FBI, I mean, you know, one, one day the FBI decided they were going to kind of pursue Martoma. And um, one of the main characters in the story, B.J. Kang, who is this very ambitious, kind of tough guy FBI agent. Korean-American. Yes. He went down to Florida to approach Martoma at his home in Boca Raton, where he had a very sort of beautiful, expensive house. He was living there with his family. And their hope was that Martoma would flip and become a cooperator to them. And they had all this, you know, they had amassed a lot of evidence, they believed, of this conspiracy involving Dr. Gilman and this drug trial. And But should I say, to, in order to get Steve Cohen? that why they wanted him, that's who they wanted him to flip I think for? that was their ultimate hope they would probably never admit that officially but it seemed quite clear from the way they were behaving now Martoma himself was a worthwhile target on his own it was a huge insider trading case just involving Martoma himself but yes I think they had a lot of questions about what Martoma had shared with Steve Cohen so BJ Kang went down there and confronted Martoma on his front lawn and he said, I want to talk to you about insider trading. Like, what happened in July of 2008? And Martoma fainted. And BJ Kang, um, you know, sort of shook his head and he had been through many of these approaches before. He had been working on this case for years. BJ Kang is in the first sentence of your prologue at the beginning of the book. He's a very key figure in this whole thing. I mean, he was one of the central FBI agents who investigated these cases and he had um yeah he he did some of the big arrests he arrested raj raj who, he, who is he he was another big hedge fund manager who was arrested and charged before the martoma case he's originally from sri lanka yes where is he today he's in prison i believe in upstate new york i'd have to double check What's hard for the outsider to understand is you, 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 talk, you talk about three groups of people from the government that make a difference. The SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, the FBI, and the U.S. attorneys. And you talk a lot in the book about how they, there's jealousy between the two different departments and all that. Let me just show Preet Bharara, who is, who is he? The U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York. So the top prosecutor in Manhattan for the federal government. Very important law enforcement figure. What's the name Barara? Uh, India, from India. Very interesting. Let's go to Preet Barara in November the 4th in 2013. This past July, we filed a criminal indictment against four SAC capital-related companies for engaging in insider trading that was substantial, pervasive, and on a scale without precedent in the history of hedge funds. Uh, three months later, we are here to announce a resolution that is matching in its magnitude. All of the charged SAC companies have agreed to plead guilty. 
All have agreed to wind down and close their outside investment businesses, and all have agreed collectively to pay total fines and penalties in the record amount of $1.8 billion. Who is this man and how does he get to where he is? He, uh, he is the son of immigrants from India. He grew up in New Jersey. His father was a medical doctor. And it's interesting because both he and his brother, Vinny, were these incredibly accomplished students. Apparently their parents were extremely demanding, sort of stereotypical tiger parents, you know, wanted them to have straight A's, uh, sacrificed a lot so they could go to good schools. And um, my understanding is that Preet wanted to be a prosecutor from early on in his career. You know, he, um, he, had, he had a very strong sense of right and wrong. He, uh, he did a lot of debate and things like that in high school, so he enjoyed standing up and arguing and developing ideas and performing. And um, he ended up going to, um, I have to double check, he ended up going to either Columbia or Harvard. I think it was Columbia Law School. Yeah, I think Columbia, Harvard undergrad and Columbia Law School. Uh, there's a lot of Ivy League graduates in my book, so sometimes I confuse them. But, and then he ended up working for Chuck Schumer, the senator from New York, as his sort of one of his chief legal counsel. And Schumer is the one who recommended him for the job he has now, which is this U.S. attorney for the Southern District job. And it's one of the most high-profile jobs, uh, you know, in, in law enforcement, um, you know, New York City has many of the most high profile cases. It has terrorism cases, narcotics cases, complicated financial crime cases. And um, Preet was told recently that President Trump uh, wants him to stay on in the role, which surprised some people since he was an Obama appointee. But again, looking at how this all works, you talked about insider trading, and I kind of learned from you that it's not that clear sometimes what insider trading is. Well, yeah, so so I could, um, I mean, I, I, there's an easy way to explain it, which is through this, um, you know, by explaining the title of the book, Black Edge. So, so there were some employees at Steve Cohen's firm. They had this method of describing different types of information. There was White Edge which was considered to be information that was publicly available that anyone could get, like companies, uh, public SEC filings, and companies, when they report their earnings, they have to make filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Anyone can look at those on the, web, on the internet. So that's white edge. Everyone kind of has access to it. It's not actually very valuable for a trader because everyone has it. Presumably, there's no money to be made from trading based on its contents. Then there's gray edge, which is information that's sort of, um, it's, it's ambiguous. For example, an analyst might call an employee of a company and say, you know, you announced this merger. How is it going? When's the merger going to close? You've announced, you know, you, you've announced this big investment that's happening. When is that going to happen? Would that have been you, by the way, when you were yes, working in the Yes, I did fund? some of this, exactly. And the person may or may not be authorized to tell you that information. So it depends. If you have a relationship with that person, if you're a very important investor, they might say to you, well, we're feeling good about it. And so then you go back to your desk and you think, okay, hmm, was that material non-public information that I am not supposed to trade on? Or was that just, you know, no big deal? And hedge funds are supposed to have compliance officers and counsel to help advise you if you end up in this situation. And a lot of the time, the information that these analysts are getting is in this gray zone. Are, so are it's hedge not funds, um, is one way to describe it, it's like they don't have the kind of rules that you do if you went to uh, a Vanguard fund or something like that. I mean, they, they're just, it's, they're not as regulated as some of the other funds are? They are more lightly regulated. That is absolutely true. And they don't have to disclose as much about so what they're doing. it's a big benefit doing. to rich people. Some people believe that. Now, a hedge fund manager would say, a lot of hedge funds do take money from um, pension fund managers. So they would say that some of their investors through these pension funds, which will kind of put chunks of money with different hedge funds sometimes, uh, so they would say, well, we're also managing money for, for teachers in California, you know, as a group. So it's not only rich people who benefit from us, but for the most part, they do cater to rich people. Oh, That's so correct. We go back to the beginning. We're talking about Steve Cohen sitting there and, and making $10 billion, whatever it is. He's not been charged with anything. 
he needs to have the edge, as you say. He well, needs to know information that other people don't know. So I would say that anyone at working at any hedge fund uh, who involved in short-term trading, meaning every day they're coming and trading in and out of stocks, all of those people want edge. That is a common term in the industry. They want edge. And, you know, there's this white edge. It's kind of useless for their purposes. There's the gray zone. And then there's black edge, which is clearly inside information. I want to go back to Matt Martoma, who you talked about, because the Sidney Gilman story, Dr. Sidney Gilman, makes the presentation in Chicago. But prior to that, you tell the story about Matt Martoma flying to Ann Arbor right ahead of that speech yep to try to gather new information about the alzheimer's drug but at the same time um he he, he it's phony about it he tells dr gummy he's coming for another reason tell that story please well so over over a number of months martoma has built up this rapport with dr gilman they talk on the phone for hours they meet for dinner you know they get together and gilman over time he's a bit lonely um he starts to see Martoma almost like a surrogate son. You know, he feels very connected to him. So gradually, and he knows he's not supposed to be sharing confidential information about the Alzheimer's drug, but over time he starts to share it because Martoma is just pushing and pushing. He really wants this information. So um, at some point it crosses the line and Gilman starts sharing information he's not supposed to be sharing. And meanwhile, Martoma is back at SAC Capital working for Steve Cohen. He's advocating very hard for them to invest very heavily in Elon and Wyeth, these two drug stocks. He's saying this this Alzheimer's drug trial is going really well. You know, no, I feel really good interrupt. about this. But if I'm Steve Cohen um, and Matt Martoma is working for me and he comes in to him and says, we got to short this uh, because this isn't going to work. Does he is the issue at that moment? Does he tell him that he has gotten this from Dr. Gilman? Well, there's some mystery at the center of it, because ultimately what happened is after pushing and advocating for months to be uh, to, to aggressively um, invest in these two companies on the basis of this trial, um, you know, Martoma you know, and there were other people at SAC who were against the idea because they didn't think the drug trial was going to work out. And there was this constant debate and arguing and no one could understand why is Martoma so confident? This is really weird. And at one point, one of Martoma's colleagues says he seems, he's acting like he has black edge. What's going on? And they couldn't get an answer. So there was all this fighting and this sort of mystery swirling around it. So it seems a little fishy, right? So then the government alleges and they had, you know, they presented at Martoma's trial, you know, airplane tickets, phone records. They had all sorts of documentary evidence that, um, you know, the week before the trial was publicly announced uh, in Chicago that Martoma flew to the University of Michigan to visit Dr. Gilman, went into Dr. Gilman's office, looked at the presentation that Dr. Gilman was working on that had all of the final drug trial results in it. Confidential presentation. Gilman had received this under lock and key from uh, Ilan. So Martoma is alleged to have looked at this. He gets, he gets back in his taxi, goes back to the airport, flies back home. And then on Sunday morning, the following day, there is a phone call with Steve Cohen. And at, Mar at uh, Martoma's trial, the government presented some of this evidence. You know, he sends an email to Steve Cohen in the morning. Sunday morning, not a typical time for a, a work call like this. And he says, I need to speak with you. It's important. They talk on the phone. No one knows what they said. And then uh, immediately afterwards, Mr. Cohen starts instructing his traders to sell off their shares. And they spend the next week sort of liquidating their whole position, almost a billion dollars. Quietly. Quietly. And it's important to note that there are many reasons why you do that quietly. I mean, if someone, if people hear that Steve Cohen is dumping shares of Elon and Wyeth, you know, it can almost trigger like a response. Let me show you some video. This is the year before the last that we showed you pre- Barrara, who is the U.S. Attorney, Southern District of New York, pointed by which president? Pre uh, Obama. President Obama. Would you say, by the way, that those positions often lead to running for Attorney General, the well, state, they're... governors, senators? Preet, in particular, is seen as someone who's got a lot of political ambition. So hired, yes, hired a, hired yeah. a PR group to bring come in, and more so than normal. Well, he in particular was seen as being very sensitive to the press coverage, yes. Okay, and, here he is. Um, this is in 2012. We're talking again about Mar Mar Matt Martoma, who is now in prison. As the criminal complaint in this case alleges, 
by cultivating and corrupting a doctor with access to secret drug data, former portfolio manager Matthew Martoma and his hedge fund benefited from what might be the most lucrative inside tip of all time. In any case, this is certainly the most lucrative insider trading scheme ever charged, allegedly resulting in an illegal windfall to the hedge fund of more than a quarter of a billion dollars, and that's billion with a B. Did Dr. Gilman, I don't know if you use the word flip on this, did he, did he become a... He did. He became the star witness in the government's case against Martoma. How big a deal was this for Preet Bharara? This was a very significant case. I mean, as he just mentioned, it was um, a $275 million profit. So that made it just monetarily, I think, the biggest insider trading case ever. And um, how, how did they initially figure out that this was an insider trading case? What, what, and now you, you've got, again, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Is that an independent group in Washington, independent of the president? Uh, well, it's a regulatory agency, and the chair, and you know, there are um, commissioners who oversee the SEC, and there's a chair who's normally appointed by the president. So often, the SEC is ostensibly independent. However, uh, it relies on Congress for its funding and its budget, and it will reflect the political views of the chairman. So, and the recent chairman. Uh, well, the the outgoing chairman is uh, Mary Jo White. Who and used to be the U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York? Way back, yes, she had Preet's job. She was at Debevoise and Plimpton. She was in private practice for a long time. I have to say that a lot of the activity that you know I cover in this book, this sort of swirling, rampant insider trading, it, a lot of it took place in the years leading up to the financial crisis when the SEC was managed for at least some of that time by by people who didn't really believe in regulation you know and there was a sense that the market could regulate itself there was a very deregulatory environment it was a lot of it was during the george bush era and at the end of it we we ended up with this huge mortgage fraud crisis and this insider trading crisis the commissioners are appointed by the president approved by the senate so they're sitting there and then down the street is the fbi yes so they're independent and they're very different the sec is supposed to be um you know, there are all sorts of different divisions, but there's the vaunted um, enforcement division inside the SEC, and they're there to enforce securities laws. And they are often doing the very painstaking, difficult work of looking at suspicious trades. So if something happens in the market, for example, um, you know, one day there's an announcement that, I don't know, AOL and Time Warner are merging. Okay, this is an ancient merger, but Okay, they're merging. Well, you look at the stock chart and it looks like, oh, wow, Time Warner's shares were up $20 yesterday before the news came out. That's really, you know, it looks like somebody knew something. So that might get flagged to the SEC. Someone, you know, there's, a, there's another agency that might send a piece of paper to the SEC that says, you guys should look into this. This is kind of, just, somebody obviously knew and loaded up on uh, shares of Time Warner right before this news came out. Okay. So then they, they, start to send out subpoenas, you know, they, they will get trading records, phone records, and they are doing this really painstaking work of analyzing all these documents and trying to figure out if something happened that shouldn't have happened. And it can take months. I mean, the Martoma case took years to kind of build, to but, put but together. Before we leave Matt Martoma, though, there's a story in the book about Harvard. Yes. And Stanford and <sighs> law school and clerkships and all. What is it? What's the story? I mean, he, we're beating up on him, but there are lots of other people in there. But it, this story uh, might be uh, useful. Well, there was so so. I'll 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 back into the story by saying during Matt Martoma's trial, um, we all came in there to the courthouse in Lower Manhattan. It was freezing, and um, one morning we we show up there, and his defense lawyers are standing there with the New York Times in their hand. They're quite enraged, and on the cover, I think, of the business section. There was this headline to the effect of Matthew Martoma falsified transcripts and was expelled from Harvard Law School. That's on the front of the New York Times, in the middle of this guy's criminal trial. And his lawyers were very concerned that members of the jury, who were supposed to kind of come, be impartial and neutral, uh, might see this. So the, the story behind the story is that, um, you know, Martoma was this very ambitious student. He went to Duke. He um, he then gained admission to Harvard Law School. Incredible accomplishment. 
uh, after, I think it was after his first year, he starts struggling a little bit, you know, and he's surrounded by these very ambitious students and everyone's getting these incredible clerkships for the summer and preparing for their careers and, um, you know, they're all competing for these coveted summer jobs. And Martoma did not feel that his grades were quite strong enough to get him one of these clerkship positions that he really wanted. He got some B's is what you're saying. He may have made a couple B's in there mixed in with the A. You know, I mean, it was a transcript that many parents would have been happy with, but it wasn't sort of perfect. So he is alleged by Harvard to have um, doctored his transcripts and then applied for these clerkships. And someone noticed something was a little off. And I mean, alerted this is school at Harvard. At Harvard. And Harvard is obviously, like all, probably all schools, they're very sensitive to scandals like this. So they, they conducted an investigation and they, they concluded that Martoma had uh, falsified the transcripts, then lied about it to try and cover it up. They were very unhappy. They voted to expel him. And he fought very hard in trying to convince them not to and, you know, tried to tell them that he had, you know, he had tried to solve the, fix the problem. He'd apologize, all this stuff. They just didn't, they didn't accept it. So he's pushed out. Um, he continued to fight for, uh, you know, to fight to be, to, to be um, reinstituted into the program, and they didn't go for it. I want to go, <clears throat> we don't have a whole lot of time left, but I want to go to a page, it's page 293 in your book, and you'll see what the purpose of this. It, it's a whole page about Cohen's ex-wife, Patricia. Um, in that relationship, but it gets down to, <clears throat> meanwhile, the prosecutors and regulators involved in the billing the case against Cohen and SAC have moved on to more lucrative careers. <clears throat> Purpose of asking you this is, uh, <clears throat> what should we think about this? I'll, re I'll read Lauren Reisner, the head of uh, Barrara's criminal division who helped negotiate SAC's $1.8 billion fine, became a partner at Paul Weiss, <clears throat> the same law firm that supplied Cohen's legal defense team. Oh, and the list goes on from there. Well, I know. And, <laughs> it's like and, and a bunch Antonio names. Apps, the yeah. prosecutor who tried the Steinberg case, which is one of those that you write about, left the government for a partnership at Milbank, Tweed, Hadley, and McCloy, another corporate law firm where she does white-collar defense work. I, I should go on, really. Barrara's deputy, <clears throat> Richard Zabel, announced that he was taking a job as general counsel at a hedge fund called Elliott Management. There are more, but... So, um, a lot of people would look at that and say that is the revolving door and that is a big part of the problem we have in Washington, which is that there are t people going from the public sector to the private sector and sort of cashing in on their uh, time in the public sector and they're not and then and then they, when they're doing their jobs as prosecutors or regulators they're not actually doing their job because they're trying to set up a future high paying job in the private sector and it let, looks let me read some more because yep. it, it just keeps going after 25 years of the FBI BJ Kang's former supervisor Patrick Carroll joined Goldman Sachs as a vice president in its compliance group you continue, Arlo Devlin Brown, who led the Martoma prosecution, became a partner at Covington and Burling, a law firm. These are mostly our law firms. Yep. The most startling move of all, however, came from Amelia Cottrell, a senior enforcement attorney at the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, who oversaw the agency's Martoma investigation. At the end of June, June um, 2015, she shocked her colleagues by announcing that she was going joining Wilkie Farr, the firm whose Cohen's long-term, long-time defense counsel Marty Klotz worked. Should we, as a public, worry about this? I uh I think it raises questions. Now, I need. I'm. I feel like I need to point out that for these people, uh, I think. I think it seems entirely normal to people in in the legal profession to do this. They, they put in a few years uh, working for the government. They're making a lot less money than they could be making working at yeah white shoe law firm. And then at the end of it, it's time to move on. They, maybe they want to make more money. It's time to send their kids to private school. And it seems very normal to them to just go get another job in the private sector at for millions of dollars, potentially. Many of them make millions. Of, I mean, some of the well, people in those videos now I know are making $5 million a year. So, um, Well, they were. I mean, I know in the government salaries, it's somewhere between one hundred twenty and $150,000. 
I don't know exactly what they are. They're still respectable salaries. But I think if you're living in New York City and you're surrounded by all these fancy Wall Street people all the time, that doesn't seem like a lot of money. It doesn't go that far. So a lot of them, and, and of course, they have these fancy Ivy League law educations and they could make they could make a lot more money than that. And I think also government work is just very exhausting too. It takes a huge toll. From, from your experience, I, by the way, you write, it's almost impossible to prosecute corporate criminals who operate at the highest levels. Well, so this is where I think this story is actually really important from a policy perspective, because here we are, um, you know, there are almost no, well, no senior executives were charged with uh, crimes related to the financial crisis. No one went to jail for that of any relevance. Uh, you could say the same thing about the insider trading stuff. I mean, Raj Rajaratnam, who's one hedge fund manager, did go to jail, but they really did not get a lot of people. And now we have this new era in Washington where we have a lot of Wall Street financiers in, the, in President Trump's cabinet. And his main message to Wall Street so far is that he's going to cut taxes and that he's going to gut financial regulation. So I think it's, a, it's an area of concern. I think people need to think about it. And I think this story is an important reminder of why intelligent regulation is actually really important why it's important to prosecute uh, fraud and crime in the white collar world. And, um, you know, if you don't do that, you end up with a system that is favoring the extremely wealthy and well connected and uh, leaving everyone else outside. And it's just not a fair, transparent system. One last story. Michael Steinberg, the perp walk, the whole idea of being arrested by the FBI. How do they do this? And by the way, where is he today? Well, you, you told us earlier he, he his conviction was overturned yeah. so, so he's he is free. a free man and um, is, is he trading i actually don't know he was looking into alternate careers last i heard um he he's very wealthy so he can do a lot of different things um you know how, the how did the arrest go by because that's an interesting story sure yeah well so so the fbi was arresting a lot of people a lot of fancy rich hedge fund guys during this period and, and he worked for sac he worked for sac he was working there at the time he was arrested oh, i guess he'd been put on leave shortly before but and the fbi really made a point you know often these um hedge fund defendants who had these very high priced smart lawyers they would say, you know, they would kind of know they were possibly going to be arrested and they'd say, well, they'd call up the prosecutors and they'd say, well, can, can we just come in voluntarily? We don't want the FBI storming into our Park Avenue penthouse and, you know, arresting our guy in front of his family. It's embarrassing. It's really upsetting. And the FBI was very adamant that they did not want to treat these hedge fund defendants any differently from a drug dealer or a petty criminal because those people do not have the luxury of having their white collar lawyer call up and walk them in in a you know civilized fashion so the fbi kind of made a point of busting in the doors of these hedge fund guys early in the morning that usually show up at five or six a.m and there's this sort of very tense scene i describe in the book where michael steinberg knows he's been kind of tipped off he's going to be arrested and he he returns to manhattan from a family vacation in florida and he gets dressed and at five in the morning he's sitting in his park avenue apartment with his attorney and just waits because he knows they're coming and sure enough right on cue bang 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 fbi you know and they came in and arrested him where did they take him they took him to um i guess they call it central processing it's a building in lower manhattan and he gets fingerprinted and arraigned and um, they, they put handcuffs on him they did handcuff him. Uh, they put him in a car. There was a, a Wall Street Journal reporter had been tipped off about the arrest, and, and um, she stood on the street and videotaped it with her phone, and that video got played on the Internet. So it was very humiliating for him. And, and, and considering the fact that his conviction was later overturned, you can understand why he would be pretty upset about this. How long have you worked for The New Yorker? Since July. What did you do be right before that? Right before that, I was a writer at Bloomberg Business Week. So when you look back at this book, what, what, Im what were the important moments for you or people or devices for you to be able to write this book? Interesting question. Well, um, personally, I found it uh, fascinating to get to kind of go inside an investigation like this. I had never become so deeply enmeshed in 
an FBI, SEC criminal prosecution the way I was able to reporting this book, and I just found that to be really interesting. And I saw the whole process in all its flaws. You, you, were you there with B.J. Kang when he was taking, listening to phone calls? No, but I was able to relive it all through my reporting. How close did you get to the whole story? I mean, were, did people let you in behind the scenes? You will have to read the book and judge for yourself. It certainly felt that way to me, but... So let's go back to the question. What was the, you know, who, who shined the light the most from your standpoint? Or who was the best who's the character in the book? And I hate to use that term, but I mean, who was the hero for you? Where should the, as the public looks at it, who should they say, that's who I trust? That's an interesting question. <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, I, I don't know if I would boil it down to a matter of heroes or not. I think everyone, even the people you would typically think of as maybe the heroes, like the FBI agents, were flawed. They did some things wrong. They certainly, um, you know, they were a little over aggressive at different points. You could you could say some people's lives got completely wrecked and kind of for nothing in the end. But um, you know, to some extent, I feel like the uh, the investigators working at the SEC are kind of the unsung heroes to some extent. They do not usually get a lot of public glory and they're doing a lot of really difficult work of just regulating and um, monitoring the securities markets. And we live in a world where everyone has money in the stock market. We all have retirement money in the stock market. So these hedge funds though do affect the average person investing in the stock market. They absolutely do because we're all in there. Our futures are tied up in the stock market and increasingly we have two markets. We have we have the market for the wealthy, well-connected, sophisticated investors like hedge fund traders and the one for everyone else. One personal question before we close, we're out of time. Are you married? Yes. Do you have a family? Yes. Do you have kids? How old are the kids? Um, can I ask why you're asking me this? <laughs> no reason. Just want to know. We I always ask these questions. Oh, you do. Okay. Sorry. Do you want to ask me again then? <laughs> no, I just want to know how yeah. old your kids are. Right? Um, uh, nine and five. And... No one's ever asked me that before, so that's why I'm, yeah. Yeah, I don't want to know anymore. I don't want to know where you live oh, or anything okay. like I that. Just, I, I mean, it's <laughs> just no one has ever asked me about them but during an interview, but that's fine. Yeah. All right, the name of the book is Black Edge. On the cover is a shark wrapped in money. What's that from? It was inspired by um, a sculpture that Steve Cohen is famous for owning, a Damien Hirst sculpture of a shark suspended in formaldehyde. He paid $8 million for it. Subtitle, Inside Information, Dirty Money, and the quest to bring down the most wanted man on Wall Street, Sheila Kohatkar, is our guest. Thank you very much. Thanks. Using a big case. So they really targeted that weakness, and they said, you have no one to put on the stand and say they saw him do it or they talked about it with him. Um, you know, there's no evidence he read this email. Even if he did read the email, it might not be illegal. And they just sort of hammered that point home over and over again. And the government attorneys left that meeting and they still felt fairly sure of what they felt, which was like, oh, it really looked pretty bad. It looked like Cohen might be guilty of something. However, they had to go and have a really hard conversation about the evidence they had and what they could do with it. And they ended up deciding that they did not have enough evidence to bring to a jury and be sure that they could win. So they ended up indicting Cohen's company instead of Cohen himself. And that company paid how much? In total, to the uh, government. in total, one point eight billion dollars. That was uh, so one chunk of that was an SEC fine, and one point two billion, approximately, was sort of a criminal settlement. Once in a while, I see that you were an, uh, a trader. Where, where did that all start? <clears throat> and we needed to find things like what is insider trading. Sure. So I, one of the reasons I became interested in this story and it really connected with me is because I started my career uh, working at two very small hedge funds. Uh, I was actually an analyst, which is a little different from a trader. So the analyst is, the, is sort of the egghead who does the research. Traders are the ones who sit there and decide when to buy or sell. And, uh, you know, often people making decisions about trades will talk to the analysts and they'll say, well, was this a good company? Should we put our money in this company or should we be selling this? You know, what's happening? What's going to happen in the future? Uh, what are the product orders like? And um, 
you know, my job was to try and analyze our investments and then help guide uh, the portfolio manager in making these decisions, and then a trader would execute them. So, um, you know, it's important to understand this word edge uh, to kind of understand the concept of inside information. So, inside Steve Cohen's former hedge fund, SAC, there was a portfolio manager who had this system for rating information, and he tried to teach it to the young guys working for him uh, so that they could stay out of trouble. Because there's a constant concern that you're going to end up with some information that you shouldn't have. And, um, you know, hedge funds are very driven by information. The better the information is that you have, the, the more likely you are to make money. If you have bad information, you're going to lose money. So everybody's out there in the market every day trying to get the best, sharpest, most useful information. Let me ask you first, about, uh, again, <clears throat> about a hedge fund. Can I invest in a hedge fund? It, that depends on uh, what your investable assets are, meaning... But let's say it's yeah. small. <clears throat> so in general, hedge funds are intended to cater to wealthy investors who can afford, in theory, to lose the money they put in. What's the difference between buying a stock from Sheila Kohatkar, author of Black Edge, who is Stephen Cohen? Stephen Cohen was and continues to be a legendary figure in the financial world. He built up an enormous personal fortune almost entirely on the basis of his incredible skill for trading. So he, he had a really strong instinct for the stock market. He would sit down behind his screens and just sort of look at the way stocks were trading every day and was believed to have this very intuitive, incredible sense of how to sort of ride the waves in the market and make money. And he has this very compelling, almost rags to riches story. He grew up very middle class in Great Neck, Long Island, which was an affluent town. His family had, um, relatively speaking, less money than a lot of others around him. So I think from an early age, you know, he felt a sort of hunger to become rich. You know, he, he was very good at playing poker. He started playing poker in high school. He went to Wharton, famous business school, and then he launched his hedge fund, SAC Capital, in 1992 and very quickly built up a multi-billion dollar fortune and he has the lifestyle to match. Um, a 36,000 square foot mansion in Greenwich, Connecticut, helicopter rides, $100 million works of art, uh, his own ice rink and Zamboni. So he became an object of extreme envy on Wall Street very quickly. S-A-C capital, does it stand for the obvious? Yes, his initials. Stephen A. Cohen. He, he, he embodied the firm in every way. Late in your book, <clears throat> there's a moment where you come in contact with him and he, you say in your book that he wouldn't talk to you for this book. Tell us about that moment. Well, I had spent several years reporting this book, and um, I went about doing that the way any investigative reporter does. You know, I, start, I had a lot of court documents. I did a lot of interviews with people, and I had tried multiple times to, you know, convince him to sit with me. And, of course, I would have loved to talk with him. And by the time the story reached its conclusion and the moment you refer to in the book, he had largely won the legal case. And I thought, you know, he may have a compelling reason to actually talk now. He kind of, he beat the system, you know. He's, he's trying to remake his reputation. So I heard he was going to be attending a, a very um, sort of rarefied special art auction at Christie's Auction House in Manhattan. And, you know, I had met with Steve Cohen's staff and his people several times. I'd written him letters. But, you know, and they'd always said, oh, maybe he'll meet with you, but they never really said no. So I went there and I just sort of ambushed him. <laughs> you know, I, um, I knew he was gonna come. He was selling a painting that night. And I stood in the door and I saw him come in and it was, it was the first time I actually really spoken to him directly. And it was, you know, it was a powerful moment for me because I felt like I knew him so well at this point. I'd spoken to dozens of people who'd worked with him, his family members, and, um, you know, we had a brief exchange and he basically either convicted or pled guilty. However, uh, the two, you know, and these were either former or current SAC employees. A handful of others were connected to insider trading more indirectly. However, the two kind of central characters at the heart of the story, they're, they're very central characters in my book, are these two former portfolio managers for Cohen's uh, fund, um, Matthew Martoma, is one of them and Michael Steinberg is the other one and Martoma is currently serving a fairly lengthy prison sentence although his case is on appeal 
And Mr. Steinberg was convicted, but then his conviction was later overturned after an appeals court made a ruling that made it much harder to convict someone for insider trading. And uh, he is now doing other things with his life. Has Stephen Cohen ever been convicted of anything or charged with anything? No, absolutely not. Well, uh, I should clarify. The SEC did charge him with failing to supervise his employees. That uh, was sort of the final thing that happened. But it was a fairly light charge that was settled uh, for a financial penalty and some modifications to his business. But he was never charged with any crime himself. And um, there was sort of a dramatic moment in the story, which I recount in the book, where you know, the government, the Department of Justice, FBI, and the SEC lawyers had spent years trying to build up a case against Cohen. And they had been, you know, trying to flip people and get cooperators who could lead them inside SEC. They had wiretaps on people. They had been uh, tracking him for years. And finally, in 2013, there's sort of this dramatic moment where they have to decide, okay, what are we going to do? And the in entire world was watching. This was a very high profile case. There was tremendous news media coverage. The financial industry was sort of riveted, wanted to know whether this huge star of their world was possibly going to go to jail. And um, I describe this scene in the book where Mr. Cohen's lawyers came in to meet with the prosecutors and make a presentation and try to persuade them not to charge their client. And this is something that apparently happens, you know, many defendants are given the opportunity to come in and sort of present their defense. So a handful of Steve Cohen's very high priced defense lawyers came in there and there were around 17 government attorneys present. These were SEC lawyers, uh, criminal prosecutors, FBI agents, all these people who'd been involved in different aspects of the case. And Mr. Cohen's lawyers, um, they made a four hour presentation. They gave out these binders to everyone in the room and they basically made the argument that, um, you know, there was this very critical email that people were wondering whether Cohen had read it and it contained what they believed was inside information. And his lawyers essentially said, you have no proof he read the email. You have no witness to put on the stand. He knew the government was very nervous about losing uh, a company or through a broker and investing in a hedge fund. Well, so hedge funds were conceived as this boutique kind of rarefied product that were catering that was catering towards wealthy investors. And the idea was that a hedge fund was going to take a lot more risk in the market, potentially, than a regular mutual fund, for example, where, you know, at Fidelity or State Street. So, um, you know, regulators looked at this and they said, well, you know, if you're going to be taking all this risk, if you're going to be borrowing money and trading it, or if you're going to be shorting stocks, which is uh, basically betting that a stock will go down rather than up, and it's a very risky activity, uh, and not everyone does it. The SEC kind of said, you can only do that if you're only taking money from people who could afford to lose the money. We don't want you taking money from middle class, you know, dentists or teachers or whoever who will be devastated if they lose this money. Well, this was a little Why trade. is the government telling, you know, protecting me? Well, you, that's the purpose of securities regulators is to make sure the market is fair and transparent and that people aren't getting fleeced by these fancy hedge fund guys. How many hedge funds are there? Thousands. Thousands. Do they all make money? Uh, I would I would uh, argue that probably most of them do not make money, but a handful of them make a tremendous amount of money and they have made the founders of the hedge funds extremely wealthy. And um, partly this is because they charge very hefty fees, much higher fees than you would pay to Vanguard or you know, any of your mutual fund companies. I mean, they charge typically two to three percent of the assets that they're managing. So in other words, if I gave them a million dollars, they would take two percent off the top. Just to kind of cover their overhead. Then at the end of the year, they figure out what profit they made. Let's say they make a hundred percent profit. In other words, their whole hedge fund starts out being worth 10 billion at the end of the year, it's worth 20 billion. So they're going to take that look at that profit, that 100% profit, and depending on the fund, they're going to take 20%, sometimes even 50% of that profit, and keep it for themselves. And that is known as an incentive fee. That is supposed to be motivation for the hedge fund manager to not do anything really foolish and to, to work really hard to make money for. How much did Mr. Cohen take from that? He 
he had some of the highest fees in the business, 50%. And I will say that even with those high fees, uh, his returns were spectacular. He, uh, especially during his earlier period, he um, was often returning 30, 40, 70%. Uh, and investors were fighting to get into his fund all the time because he was just churning out profits. And when did you work in, the, in a hedge fund? Uh, I was working in a hedge fund from around, let me think here, 98 to 2002. And so, how big was it? How big was the office? Tiny. And I, as soon as he figured out who I was, he, he sort of said, oh, I, you know, I don't think I can really talk to you. And he sort of ran away. And um, he looked very relaxed. He arrived just before the auction was set to begin, which I thought was just interesting because he's so important in the art world. He's literally one of the biggest and most important modern art collectors in the world. Uh, he knew that Christie's would never start without him. I mean, he was a VIP in that world. So, um, you know, and I sort of said to him, you know, what are you doing tonight? Are you buying or selling? And I, I knew it had been reported he was selling a painting uh, out of his collection. And he said, oh, no, I'm selling, I'm selling. And then he went into the auction, and just a few minutes later, he paid, I think it was $140 million for a Giacometti sculpture. Let me stop you. Let's look at a little piece of video that shows people what he paid, 140, I think you say 141 million. Yeah. Let's just watch this. How could that be worth $141 million? <laughs> well, it is worth whatever someone is willing to pay for it. That's how the market works. And... Um, it is interesting because he, I think Cohen uh, is reported to have purchased at least two of those sculptures for $140 million range. He'd bought one prior to this one that was Pointing Man. I think he'd bought, um, he purchased another one called Chariot as well. Uh, I think part of the reason the prices have become so elevated for these particular works of art is because this very, very small group of hedge fund billionaires in particular have become competitive about art collecting and um, you know I think it happened to a lot of them that they they achieved a lot of financial success fairly early and they sort of realized that they were still not seen as these sort of sophisticated cultured people they were just thought of as Wall Street guys and many of them became interested in the art world you know it was a way to just enter this whole other universe of sort of high culture and you would have your photo up here in the society pages, you could get your name onto a wall in a museum. So many of uh, Cohen's contemporaries became really interested in art and they, they end up in this sort of arms race bidding up certain artists into these stratospheric prices and there is, you know, a lot of people believe there's a big bubble in the art market. How much is he worth today? Uh, I believe it's at least $10 billion. Uh, he. Um, you know, by the time all of this legal drama ended, he was forced to sort of shut down his hedge fund, SAC Capital, but he was still allowed to manage his own money through his private family office. So he's he's got a pool of his own money, it's upwards of $10 billion, and he still trades it every day in the market. So his lifestyle is largely unchanged from what it was before. How many people, when he had SAC Capital, <clears throat> went to prison or were they were convicted or they pled and are going to be sentenced? How many around him? Well, uh, at least eight were 